Welcome to The Holy Post. A recent article in The Atlantic by Tim Alberta reveals how the political polarization in the country is now tearing evangelical churches apart. And Marvin Olasky, the former editor of World Magazine, says that as he's watched evangelicals over the last 30 years, he's concluded that there's no question that party politics for many of them has become far more important than the gospel. Because Caitlin and Christian are both still in Europe, Drew Dick is joining me and Phil to discuss these articles and what all the political polarization means for the future of the church. Then we have another edition of Barna Briefs with David Kinneman, who shares new statistics about the staggering number of pastors who are seriously thinking about quitting the ministry. A big reason? Political polarization. David shares the latest numbers and offers some wisdom about how to go forward. All of that, plus climate change is making some progressives question the morality of having kids, and South Korean college students are flush with cash. Before we jump into today's episode, a quick note to our Patreon supporters. We have a bunch of content exclusive to Patreon supporters of The Holy Post, things like bonus interviews with our guests, and we have two additional shows that we do regularly for Patreon, one called Christian Asks, where Christian Taylor talks to me about questions about the Bible, and a brand new show called Getting Schooled by Caitlin Chess. The first episode just came out last week, and there's more coming, so if you haven't yet signed up to become a supporter of The Holy Post, now is a great time to do it. You'll get access to all that bonus material, plus you can join us for our upcoming conversation about our newest Holy Post book club selection. Go check out how you can become a supporter at holypost.com and click the Support Us button. Okay, here is episode 514. Hey there, welcome back to the Holy Post Podcast. This is Phil Vischer. I am here with Sky Jatani again. Hi, Sky. You sound surprised, like I don't go away. I just keep turning up. Again, Sky. Well, we've had so many, you know, we've had a lot of changing faces over the last few weeks, but Sky's face is a constant. Like the sun. He's smiling. And we got Drew Dick. Hi, Drew. Hey. How are you? Feels good, man. This feels like a bit of a reunion. Yeah, right? yeah. You used people, to sit in more frequently. People, you um, will ask me like, "How do you get on the Holy Post?" And I say, "I used to live a mile from the studio." Uh huh. And once in a while, they wouldn't have a guest, and Sky would call me and say, "Can you be here in 15? Get over here. <laughs> yeah. And I'd say, "I'm watching TV right now, but let me move some things around." Yeah, let me put on some pants. See what I can do. Put on some pants. Yeah, you, and, you had the, and I'll come over. The, disfor- the disfortune of being a regular when no one wanted to be a regular on the Holy <laughs> Post. It didn't did matter. You say, did you say disfortune? The, is the that rest a word? Is a history. Unfortunate? Mis- I, think, I think it's misfortune. 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 Yeah, Mis- and Mrs. Ditch. Fortune if she's married. Okay, yeah. and now it's time for the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? your favorite podcast host if it's breakfast get your toast it's sky and phil and the holy post sky and phil and the holy post with special guest host drew dick so apparently the theme song fell out of last week's show and they had to go back and correct it and put it back in there was 20 seconds of silence if you if you listened to the show right away last week 20 seconds of silence and then yeah, that's not good. That's not a good look. That was weird. Hey, uh, speaking of songs, Phil. Yeah. What? Um, sh- shouldn't we be singing like the happy birthday song to you? To <sighs> no, because my birthday, you have a birthday is birthday boy. Tomorrow. It's tomorrow, right? Yeah, it's tomorrow. It's not today. Yeah, but that's not, you know we're not going to see you because you're going away. You're going on a trip. Yeah, I know. I know. We're recording this early, so well, no, you don't need to sing happy birthday. But well, but happy Drew, birthday. Thank you. If Drew could sing his best version of Happy Birthday, Mr. President, in kind of a sultry voice, I would yeah, like the, the that. breathy version. Yeah. Come on, Drew. I don't I don't think the world's ready, guys. No, really? I'd have to wear a different okay. outfit too. Okay. I haven't done something in a few weeks because, you know, when we have guests on, I don't like to startle the guests, but it's Drew Dick. And everybody knows that it's fun to startle Drew Dick. So it's time for news of the butt. And now it's time for news of the butt. South Korean toilet. Are, is that a good way to start a story, Drew? Are you excited already? You have my attention. Yeah. Better than a North Korean toilet. Oh, is that for sure? Oh, man. South Korean toilet allows students to pay for things with their poop. Talk about making a deposit. <laughs> 
or a donation. In the past, we've brought you news of smart toilets that could analyze your poop for diseases and even recognize your butt. We've even explored how toilets could help power homes. Now there's a new South Korean toilet that might be even more impressive. The toilet turns excrement into energy and even allows students to purchase stuff with the amount of poop they produce. Yes, you read that right. At a university in South Korea, human waste is being used to help power a building. And this process also turns excrement, get this, this is, I think, what we've been waiting for literally since the dawn of time. This process turns excrement into a digital currency. Crypto's uh, been doing that for years now. Crypto poop. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, crypto Good turned point. nothing into digital currency. Mm -hmm. in air. The toilet employs a vacuum pump to draw waste into an underground bioreactor, which features microorganisms that break down the waste to methane. This then becomes a source of energy for the building, powering a gas stove, hot water boiler, and solid oxide fuel cell. Now, is that the future? Is that the future where, you know, grandma, you can't get on the internet until you poop? <laughs> Nothing works. Nothing Eat works in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Until we probe. Um, its special pump reduces water use. The inventor has conceived a virtual currency called Jigul, which means honey in Korean. Each student, just don't even think about that. Each student who uses the toilet earns 10 Jigul a day that they can use to buy products at the university, such as freshly brewed coffee, instant cup noodles, fruits, and even books. How do the they know? How do they know it's your account? Uh, maybe they use that uh, that anal uh, print reader that we <laughs> talked about. Because <laughs> we all, right. we're like snowflakes, Sky. We're mm -hmm. like snowflakes from the bottom up. No two anal prints are the same. I don't know. Maybe they have to use their student ID. If we think out of the box, feces has precious value to make energy and manure. You know that feces can make manure? No, I think feces is manure, sir. Sir, I have put this value into ecological circulation. All in all, it's a superior eco-friendly toilet that lets students at the university earn money from pooping in order to buy products at the university. Well, wow. given some university educations this, these days, that's about what they're worth. Oh, boy. Their exchange. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. this, this story makes me sad because it just shows that the greatest geniuses in the world are no longer in America. Oh. And, and here's the thing. If, no one can out poop America. Okay. I know. I know. Right. I, I feel like if we would have had this toilet earlier, we could have really, it's like a right space race. Yeah. Right. And if you just put one connected to every Taco Bell, how many Taco Bells are there? A zillion? A zillion Taco Bells. So one, one um, digital currency toilet next to every Taco Bell. And it's like a perpetual motion machine. You, you wouldn't need money. You just eat and poop in equal amounts. In fact, you could just have every time someone makes a deposit into the toilet, another taco comes out at you and you just stay there. And it, you just, it's a continual It's process. a little bit like the ma matrix turning people into batteries. You just, you're in a pod and, and through one end of the pod comes tacos and out the other end goes poop. And then you're fueling the economy and you don't have to. There's move. an incentive. There's an incentive to have more children because think of the, those diapers are valuable all of a sudden. Those diaper oh, genies are really making right. wishes come true. That's right. We had a story about diapers being uh, uh, used as fuel to, to heat buildings. I think it was in Japan. They were using, because they were using adult diapers because they have such right. an adult diaper problem. Uh, Drew, would you say you have an adult diaper problem? Not yet, ever? thankfully. Not yet, okay. Well, but that depends. Get it? Uh, <laughs> but, oh, but I, <laughs> I'm a dad, okay? I got to throw in a dad joke, all right? <laughs> uh, but I do feel stupid for throwing away all the diapers that my kids filled all these years. Uh, yeah, and you could have yeah, used them. You could have yeah, turned them in for tacos. Side hustle, you know, because Uber, you know, with COVID, that kind of went away. So if someone's looking for a good side hustle, uh -huh, maybe uh -huh. this. Kind of a crappy job. diapers but... could have paid for their college education, Drew. Right. In speaking of children, speaking of children, no, not for their education, for their ramen noodles while they're doing homework. I don't think you could actually exchange it for tu tuition. It was like things oh. in the, uh, you know, stuff from the gift shop from the student union. Hey, I pooped and I got this water bottle. Whee! I okay. see the t-shirt. I pooped Drew. and all I got was this stupid water bottle. This has been the news of the pop. Uh, Drew sent this in. 
it is a, um, a kind of a, a contrast of two different worldviews. It's a quote from Ezra Klein. We've talked about Ezra Klein a little bit. He's a very thoughtful guy, uh, columnist, podcaster. And then a response from Andrew Walker, who's a uh, ethicist, philosophy professor at one of the Southern Baptist universities. So Ezra Klein said, and this was a post from Ezra Klein. Over the past few months, I've been asked one question more than any other. It comes up at speeches, at dinners, in conversations. It's the most popular query when I open my podcast to suggestions time and again. Okay, uh, Sky, do you have any idea what the, what the number one question yeah, Ezra Klein... This. Oh, you saw it? Okay. So I did. You know. I saw it. So that'd be cheating. Okay. Yeah, that would be cheating. The question comes in two forms. The, the number one question... Ezra Klein is asked everywhere he goes by everyone. Is it, how do you come up with your podcast guests? Is it, why is your hair so silky smooth and shiny? Is it, have you ever met Drew Dick? He's the funniest guy on Twitter. No, it's not any of those things. What is it? The first form of the question is, should I have kids given the climate crisis they will face? And the second form of the question is, should I have kids knowing they will contribute to the climate crisis the world faces. Those are the questions that Ezra Klein gets more than any other, which led Andrew Walker to state, a friend pointed this out to me, and how true. The below quote from Ezra Klein's column is an illustration of the different worlds some of us occupy. I have literally never had this question asked to me in any setting. Uh, Worldview matters. Drew, has anyone ever asked you if given the state of the world, it would be better for them not to have children? I must be occupying Andrew's universe because that has never been asked to me. Um, although I will say I, I have a, a relative who he and his wife made that decision not to have children uh, because of the potential environmental impact. Oh, um, so okay. yeah, they, how do their children feel about that? They're, they're they're they have a dog and a cat, and so I don't know how they feel. Okay, they're 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 pet children. Um, so yeah, no, I, I it's it's definitely. There are people out there thinking about this, right? When they're uh, planning their families or not planning their families. But it is interesting because, yeah, Andrew, he's in like, you know, Southern Baptist convention world. And yeah, yeah not surprised. That is not a pressing query for people. I have heard this discussed. I would not say it is a frequent topic of discussion in my circles. Sky? Right. Yeah, I've... Uh... I've been asked why I had children and I think that was meant as an insult, but it wasn't, it wasn't about climate change. Um, okay. Ezra Klein lives in San Francisco. So obviously yeah. it's a little bit different culturally than some other parts of the country. But what struck me about this is it, it, it was sort of an echo of things I recall hearing back in like my high school days when I was kind of getting more into evangelical circles a little bit. And people would ask questions like, if Jesus is coming back soon, should I get married? And what's the point right. if, you know, if the end is coming, why bother right. with college? That kind of stuff would come up from time to time. Um, and it, it's just more evidence that forget what you think about climate change as a scientific reality, which I do think it's a scientific reality. So much of climate change and environmentalism has taken on the characteristics of religion, even to the point of family planning and raising children, all that stuff is now being framed in, in religious right. ideology. Because because science has, you know, the science of climate and the proponents of that on the on the extreme end have developed really a an a kind of an apocalyptic eschatology. Right. You know, that I mean they've gone back to, you know, it's all gonna burn. It's all gonna burn. So what are we doing? Why even all for the fire. Yeah, Please. why even bother? I find it interesting that effectively, you know, some extremely progressive people are looking at human civilization and saying, I think I'm going to be the generation that shuts it down. I just right. don't it, think we should keep this going any longer. I think what's disturbing about it, and Ezra Klein actually gave, he has two children. And so he gave a response and both in an article and on his podcast to this question that I thought was kind of interesting. It's worth listening to. But what's really disturbing about the anti-child movement among the environmental far left is it, it, it fundamentally, fundamentally believes that humanity 
is wrong and a problem and uh, an, an impediment to the flourishing of the world. And so when you have right. that negative of view of humanity, not only does it lead to despair personally and to not wanting to procreate and have your own children, but it leads to all kinds of other negative attitudes about your fellow neighbors, your fellow citizens, the rest of the world. It's a profoundly disturbing and pessimistic view of humanity. And even though as Christians, we would argue humans are sinful and we've done terrible things and the world is, is completely polluted by sin. At its core, Christianity still holds a highly optimistic and dignified view of humanity, that we are made yeah. in God's image and there is a positive future, which means we are people of hope and we still procreate. So I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> well, it, I find it for your kind of guy. Drew and I both took vows of chastity years ago. Well, I, there's something that should send up, send up red flags for any worldview that is so pessimistic, pessimistic about humanity that it says we shouldn't have children and maybe it'd be better off if humans didn't exist. Isn't, That's a is it, pretty yeah, bad isn't, worldview. Isn't there something a little innately dehumanizing about that to, to say humanity, you know, our brothers and sisters, our neighbors are a plague? And yeah. really should be ended? Isn't that just, shouldn't we kind of go, hey, I'm not sure that's a healthy way to look at people? Yeah. And, and what's disturbing is the next step is not just to um, believe all humanity should be eradicated, but it's it's then determining which humans are really the worst problem. Maybe we should get rid yeah. of them. Well, and we're that, supposed to eat the rich. I know that for sure. <laughs> and then, right, and then yeah, poop, it's, poop them out in exchange for ramen noodles, I think. One of the things that was interesting in Ezra Klein's response to this, and again, you should read it or listen to it for yourself, is he he essentially says, we have hyped up the problem of climate change too much to the point where people don't want to have children and, and gives a, a historical context saying like 500 years ago, it was way worse to be a human being on this planet 500 years ago than it is today. And it even if the worst predictions about climate change over the next hundred years prove to be true, it's not mm -hmm. going to be as bad as people are thinking it's going to be. And this is coming from an extremely left-wing progressive, you know, he's a vegan, he doesn't believe in eating meat for environmental reasons and other stuff, but he still had kids. And his argument is the far radical left on the environmental front is terrifying people to the point where they won't have children. It's because they want to see concrete action taken on climate change, but to do that, they're exaggerating the real threat. And that's a problem. So it's interesting that well, somebody on the far left is saying they're they're being too hyperbolic about climate change, right? And and I I don't think anyone knows exactly what's going to happen. I I believe in climate change that it's happening that it's anthropogenic, you know, human caused in in large part. Um, but we need a little epistemic humility, uh, which it sounds like he has. We don't know exactly how it's going to play out. There have been a lot of junctures historically where people have really. Uh, been scared that the world is about to end or things were going to go south. And they retain that hope in humanity because it may be that the children that aren't born yet are going to be some of the people that come up with solutions for climate change, right? Right. right. Um, and what disturbs me, I see this in the area of the country that I'm in, the Pacific Northwest, is there is a strong kind of antinatalism that pervades the culture. You know, people that have more than one kid are breeders and uh, part of the problem. And so... I'm always a little sheepish when I drive my minivan into downtown Portland, um, mm -hmm. but um, I have three kids, so you know that is insane. I don't know if that's bad. I'm on the <laughs> oh my gosh! Don't that's you know about birth control? How did that even program. happen? I, I do not know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I broke my vow of chastity three times. Okay, Phil, um, <laughs> and here we are. So yeah, no, I mean I agree, Sky, and and with Ezra, this this kind of we don't know exactly how this is going to play out. And a worldview that is that pessimistic that says like any new humans is a problem. Um, although I will say it's kind of refreshing to see uh, secular culture on the same page as my evangelical childhood. They all think the world's going to end now. So, hey, interesting times. Well, yeah. And, yeah. And that's a mark of religion that has to have an eschatology. It has to have a sense of mission and purpose. It has to have some universal cosmic mission. And, and that's what you see in the environmental movement and why... It is a religion. I'm sorry. It is a religion. I'm not saying there aren't truths there, that there aren't scientific facts behind some of this stuff, but the way it animates people looks very much like religion. And for any good story, 
the best way to keep things moving is a ticking clock element. That's Whether right. it's G Jesus' return or the doomsday clock with uh, the Soviet Union or, yeah, California is either going to have an earthquake and slide into the sea or burst into flames and die. So don't <laughs> have any more children. Okay. Um, we're done talking about guns for a while. We've talked about guns for like three straight weeks. Uh, I'm sure, Drew, you've been doing nothing lately but talking about guns around the house and everywhere you're going. And brandishing all my guns. Brand no, I don't have any. You I mean your <laughs> biceps, right? That's, what that's you're right. When, the when, gun, you when I talk about the gun show, yeah, that's, I'm talking yeah. about arms. Exactly. Um, so we're going to go back to Trump. It's time to go back to Trump. I figured that would be, you know, enough controversy, enough going where people don't want you to go. We haven't talked about Donald Trump in a while. And he's kind of in the news because there's this, I don't know, hearings going on and stuff and about the whatever, the January 6th, whatever. But there are a couple of really long, really good pieces that were written in the last few weeks that, that I've had. To, I was going to talk about actually earlier, but then all the gun stuff came up and got in the way. One of them is a, a very long piece in the Atlantic uh, under the by Tim Alberta entitled How Politics Poisoned the Evangelical Church. Uh, the movement, the subtitle is The Movement Spent 40 Years at War with Secular America. Now it's at war with itself. And you should read it if you have access to The Atlantic. It's, it's quite long, but it's really a study of two different evangelical pastors that take two very different paths, but under kind of the same assumption. And the first pastor he follows is Pastor Bill uh, Bolin or Bolin of Floodgate Church in Brighton, Michigan, who has started uh, doing 15-minute kind of Fox News-style rants at the beginning of each service before he opens the Bible and rails against liberals and vaccines and promotes ivermectin and, you know, just the whole thing. So he says, uh, for a decade, Bolin preached to a crowd of about 100 people on a typical Sunday. Then came Easter 2020, when Bolin announced that he would hold indoor worship services in defiance of Michigan's emergency shutdown orders. Local politicians and activists borrowed his pulpit to promote right-wing interests. Floodgates' attendance soared as members of other congregations defected to the small roadside church. By Easter 2021, okay, 12 months later, Instead of 100 people every week, he was up to 1,500 people every week. Nice so, church growth strategy right there. <laughs> 15 times the number of people because he started talking politics uh, before every sermon from an uh, extremely right-wing perspective. Then he contrasts him with Pastor Ken Brown, another evangelical pastor of another conservative, mostly white church, also in the uh, Detroit suburb area. He has a church called Community Bible Church. And Brown reached out to this author who had asked a question online, uh, explaining what his concern about the combustible dynamics within the evangelical church and describing his own efforts as the conservative pastor of a conservative congregation to keep his members from being radicalized by the lies of right-wing politicians and media figures. Brown said to him, uh, the, the author, the crisis for the church is a crisis of discernment. Discernment, one's basic ability to separate truth from untruth, is a core biblical discipline, and many Christians are not practicing it. So we have one pastor who started talking about politics as a way to fight back, you know, against the decay of America and the left and all that. Another pastor has decided I have to I have to talk about politics too to fight back against disinformation and people getting radicalized by the kind of stuff that other pastor is talking about that's coming from, you know, right-wing media. And then he does mention a third pastor of a third church also in the Detroit suburbs who just refuses to talk about politics at all. He says, I am just going to talk about Jesus. I'm just going to talk about the gospel. I just, I don't think we should get into any of that stuff. So, so I'm curious for you two guys, do you have an instinct that one of those pastors is doing it right? Depends what you mean by right. I guess, number one, if uh, <laughs> we're talking about church growth. When I start my mega yeah. church, Phil, I have yeah, no what choice. Metric? Gonna the same. Mega, what can metric? Can it be a, a mega, mega church? And what, do you think, what do you think about the argument between I have to engage politics because of what's happening, even if I lose people, to politics is really not what I'm about, and I'm just not going to go there 
because uh, I want to focus on Jesus. I don't That's think a trickier that, question. Take it away, Sky. Well, I think what I mean, the devil's in the details here, but in general, like when you read the epistles, when you read Paul or John or Peter or James, um, they didn't shy away from calling out and naming the uh, the her- heresies and the false teaching that was going on in churches with people they loved and cared about. So you you can't say, oh, Gnosticism is taking over the church in, in Corinth or you know, pick your location or Ephesus. I'm just going to ignore that and talk about Jesus. Okay. They talked about it. They talked about the false teaching that was going on and they corrected it. And I think a faithful pastor right now, if they find that their people are being led astray by Christian nationalism or some other heretical gospel, it's their pastoral responsibility to talk about that and warn their people of why this is contrary to the way of Jesus and why this doesn't fit with our biblical calling. And you can't, it's just like any doctor. You can't say, well, I know there's a tumor here. I'm going to ignore that tumor and just make sure the patient has a really healthy diet. Like a healthy diet's important, but you got to deal with the tumor. Like you can't just ignore it. So I think you have to do both. And the fact that we haven't been talking about these heretical dynamics that have been coming into the church literally for decades in America is why we're in the predicament we're in right now. Drew, you've done a lot of writing for pastors. What what do you tell them about this stuff? Well, I think, you know, most pastors that I've dealt with would rather swallow a fork than get political from the pulpit. I think there's a misperception that they, they're just dying to go there. And, and clearly some some pastors are like the one that that was mentioned first in this article. Um, but most just don't want the fight. Um, and like Sky says, sometimes it's essential. Although I would say like with something like Gnosticism, you know, the heresy that almost swallowed Christianity in the first century, that was a theological uh, uh, fight. And of course, mm-hmm. you have to have those. So I think you need to be very careful that when it's like an extraneous kind of political um, uh, topic that you're addressing, although sometimes, of course, you have to, uh, to be a, a prophetic biblical witness. But I do have some sympathy for that third way guy that you mentioned, because <laughs> that might be my tack. I mean, this makes all this crazy, these Trumpy churches make me nostalgic for my childhood. So I grew up, you know, evangelical, maybe quasi fundamentalist. We didn't talk about politics. We didn't even care. I mean, we had a suspicion toward the outside world, you know, they're Babylon and Babylon's going to bab. But we were busy fighting about theology <laughs> or about choruses versus hymns or about the color of, of the carpet in the foyer. Right. And my dream is to go back to that, guys. That's what I want. I wow. want to see the church fighting about the color of the carpet in the church. You're really, you're really painting a, a captivating vision Thank of you. what we could return to. What ha- whatever happened to organ versus guitar? I just love those culture. The worship wars. war of the eighties and nineties. It yeah, warms the cockles the of my heart. Choir versus the worship band. Come on, let's get heated up about that. Okay, Drew, but I want I want to push back on your categories there to say that you know we need to have arguments about theology and doctrine, but not about politics. Where is the line between theology and politics in the first place? Because I don't know. You can have a congregation that is say completely idolatrous in its love affair with the Chicago Cubs and devote themselves to the Chicago Cubs and give their money and time and energy and start sacrificing the education and care of their children to this cult of Chicago Cubs. And if you're their pastor, you could say, well, you know, that's just sports. That's not theology. Even though it's the thing that is defining your people's devotion and lives, it's theological at that point. And so we're talking about politics, but what we are really talking about is theology. What has the affections and hearts and minds, what is shaping the behavior and the, the, the spiritual formation of the people in our churches? If it's politics, it's become theological. Yeah, that's, no, that's a great point. And the, the boundary between the two is incredibly blurry, especially these yeah. days, right? And, and if, politics, you're, not, I mean, if, if yeah. you're not careful, we're going to sit Caitlin Chess on you. Talking about <laughs> right, no, and she's, <laughs> theology she's so good on politics. this topic. Uh, and she's absolutely right. Um, and so, yeah, in, in a sense, everything's political. I guess I'm, I'm thinking more along the, the lines of partisan politics, national politics. Um, and and it's true, though, that those have become idols. I think politics, national politics in particular, is sort of the de facto religion of our day. Um, yeah. I see it in people that I know. I'm thinking of, a, uh, I won't say 
his name, that would be mean. But a guy that I know who his family's a disaster, he's divorced now, unemployed, and he spends like 20 hours a day online on these hyper conservative chat rooms, obsessed with every story, fighting it out online. And I look at him and I go, that's your religion. I mean, you're dying right. for it. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And so <clears throat> when you have parishioners that are that sucked in to uh, especially that hyper partisan uh, culture war sort of mentality, you have to address it. I guess I'm thinking more in terms of like, OK, here's issue X. This is what to believe on this. I think when you can remain a generalist who's talking about discernment, uh, that's that's the preferable thing, because the danger on the other side is, oh, man, we start going there on all these political issues and then, oh, yeah. We need to get to the gospel, right? <laughs> um, but I, I recognize how thorny that question is. That's for sure. Okay. I'm going to move on to the next piece, which is another long piece that's worth reading. You know who Marvin I Alasky do. is? Yes. He's a legend. Marvin a Alasky, legend. the longtime editor of World Magazine, the big three Christian, uh, conservative Christian magazines, Christianity Today, Charisma for Charismatics, and World Magazine. And Marvin Olasky was the editor of World for 30 some years. He left, we've talked about it before, he left um, the year before last, partly in protest of the new direction that was coming with world opinions, which are taking, we're taking much more um, kind of far right opinions. So he wrote a piece, a very long piece for the National Review called The 60 Years War, Evangelical Christianity in the Age of Trump. And it's really worth reading if you can get a hold of uh, a hold of it. I, I will kind of summarize it. He says, Six, uh, since 2016, numerous books uh, with titles such as The Power Seekers have argued that evangelicals are melding Machiavelli and Christianity. Okay, Machiavellianism, the ends justify the means. It's you don't need to be virtuous. If it means you're going to lose, you need to do what wins. Um, has the Republican Party become the Republican Party platform become more important than the gospel for many who identify as evangelicals? He says he had a special barometer for seeing where people were, which was the thousands of subscriber letters he received during decades as editor in chief of World. He says, when I wrote a month before the 2016 election that the GOP nominee Donald Trump was unfit to be president, 2000 letters flooded in with four out of five angry about my assessment. Uh, here's what surprised me. Uh, he said he wasn't that surprised by that since 80% of evangelicals supported Trump. But what did surprise him was the intensity of evangelical support for President Trump grew year by year and even increased after his stolen election harping and the events of January 6, 2021. So he wrote back um, just recently to 50 of the people who wrote him angry letters and asked whether they were still pro-Trump. And everyone that replied said, yes, many offering biblical justifications. After reading those letters, he says, I wasn't surprised by three numbers from a recent PRRI Institute uh, poll, starting with 78, the percentage of white evangelicals who agree with the idea that America is in danger of losing its culture and identity. Then there's 60, the percentage of white evangelicals who think the presidential election was stolen, and 58, the percentage of white evangelicals who say they trust Donald Trump. Each one of those numbers, each percentage is higher than that in any other large demographic group. So white evangelicals are more likely to think America is in danger of being lost, uh, more likely to think the election was stolen, and more likely to say Donald Trump is a trustworthy human being. So... Alasky says, what I can say regarding white evangelicals is, yes, political passion is consuming American evangelicalism. And yes, the Republican Party platform has become more important than the gospel for many who identify as evangelicals. But they would not put it that way. They would typically explain their concern in three ways. OK, so this is Marvin Alasky saying all these people I've interacted with over the years. This is how they explain their support for Donald Trump. First, some see America as the new Israel, God's chosen country that's now being taken over by God's enemies. Second, some stress Trump's judicial appointments, the Supreme Court. We need the Supreme Court for abortion, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and he says he's had really good conversations with people about whether Supreme Court appointments outweigh uh, Trump's coarsening cultural impact. Then the third explains uh, he believes a lot of evangelicals simply feel desperate. 
Uh, their letters make, uh, he said, make me understand that many evangelicals are like the abused wife who falls into the arms of anyone who punches her oppressor, even if he's just the next bully to come along. So then he goes through other research that supports it. And then he relates the whole thing to the 30 years war from 1618 to 1648. And that's how you know you're talking with a history junkie when you're talking about Donald Trump one second and he's talking about a war from the 17th century the other second. The 30 years war, which from 1618 to 1648 killed as many as one third of the inhabitants of Germany and the surrounding areas started as a religious war. But before long, it turned into something very different, which Goethe later characterized as uh, the ecclesiastical element was the varnish with which passions and ambitions were coated to deceive oneself and others. So it started out as a religious war, soon just became a coating, a covering to make it palatable to do what you really wanted to do, which was take over the next guy's country or kill those guys that you really don't like. Um, so then he goes back to the history of evangelicalism in America and the founding of the National Association of Evangelicals in 1942 and the moderate tone of evangelicalism under Eisenhower and Billy Graham. Um, and then in, in 1962, exactly 60 years ago, school prayer was banned uh, by the, the Supreme Court named unconstitutional, uh, which was a highly unpopular decision. 79% in a Gallup poll disapproved of the Supreme Court decision. They followed up with another case the next year that banned devotional Bible reading in public schools. Uh, Harold Ockengay, the founder of the uh, National Association of Evangelicals, said the Supreme Court had placed, quote, America in the same position as communist Russia. So we were becoming communists by banning uh, the Bible. So uh, Olefsky says 1962 is as good a spot as any for dating the beginning of America's religious war. Pat Buchanan um, 30 years later, would say at the Republican National Convention, there's a religious war going on in our country for the soul of America. And it was on like Donkey Kong. The political war has become less tied to religion and more a register of tribalism and opportunism like the 30-year war. So look, for example, at the effect of President Trump, who held up a big Bible in Lafayette Square during the summer of 2020. Some pundits theorized he would drive many away from the evangelical label, and he did, but surveys show he brought in millions more. One in six Trump voters who did not self-identify as evangelical in 2016 changed their minds and said they were evangelical in 2020. Crunching the data a different way, a Pew Research survey found that among all white adults who participated in both the 2016 and 2020 surveys, 25% described themselves as born again or evangelical in 2016, and 29% described themselves the same way in 2020, which, which Olavsky says that means either Trump was one of the greatest proselytizers in the past 2,000 years or the definition of evangelical has changed. Um, so one religious historian notes that Trump's evangelical supporters may have given up on Christianizing Trump, but no one can dispute that he succeeded in Trumpifying American Christianity. Ouch. Ouch. And then he gets to Cyrus um, and all the comments that Trump is the new Cyrus. Trump is Cyrus. Googling Cyrus and Trump brings 24 million results. Um, he's been equated with Cyrus in do dozens of books and thousands of articles. Machiavelli, now the historian comes out, around five centuries ago wrote about Cyrus. Cyrus was, of course, the Persian king um, that uh, let the Israelites return to the promised land and, and rebuild the temple. Meadow Babylonians had become soft and many Persians, by the, the time Cyrus came into power, had a virtue ethic that would not allow them to slaughter peaceful people. So the Persians had become soft. They wouldn't kill innocent people that weren't fighting them. So Tyrus, uh, Cyrus toughened up his Persians and taught them to practice virtue only when it paid off for them. This is why Machiavelli was a big fan of Cyrus and wrote about him. The political beauty of the Trump equals Cyrus equation is that Trump's character flaws are not a strike against him, but a signal that he's the real thing. This new Cyrus is a non-Jew, a non-Christian, and a non-nice guy. And that's what we wanted. A non-nice guy, to, as some people have described it, we need somebody to hate all the right people for us so that we don't have to. Um, 
The political, oh yeah, I read that part. Becoming, um, this is Olevsky wrapping up. He says, becoming a Christian in 1976 and then having a pen pal relationship with world readers, let me interact for 40 years with great people, compassionate and self-sacrificing. Since 2016, I've seen the slow growth of callous conservatism among some politicized evangelicals. And since 2020, it has metastasized. Will evangelicals who said character doesn't count now also say crazy doesn't count? That's Olavsky's 60-year religious war in America, comparing it to the 30-year war in Europe and the rise of Machiavellianism, which pointed to Cyrus as an inspiration, which we are now doing again to justify the bad behavior of Donald Trump. Amen. Funny because- Good night. Thank you. You realize when you criticize Trump to some of these hardcore evangelical Trump supporters, why your words are like white noise is you're saying, look at how bad he is. He's amoral. He's this. And they're yeah. like, yeah, yeah, it's, he, it's yeah, just he's, what we he's need. a bad guy, but he's the utilitarian bully that we need. Uh, so you think you're saying something that's bad and maybe they even see it as good. So that's that was fascinating. It brought to mind as I was reading this, actually an experience I had with letters. So I write a... Um, a humor newsletter for Christianity Today. There's a plug for it. Um, anyway, it's really just recycled tweets, but don't tell them that. Um, but one time I did a humor newsletter and the, the subject line was, if Trump was your youth pastor, and it was this, I opened up by saying like, whatever you think of the president, Trump was president at the time. I said, you got to admit, he'd be a pretty funny youth pastor. And I made some dumb jokes about, he'd always teach on second or two Corinthians and he'd build a wall around the church, you know, things like that. I thought it was just kind of fun. Just all in good fun, right? All you didn't mean nothing get, by it. Yeah, usually I get a couple letters, right? Usually they start with, I don't know if you're trying to be funny, but you weren't. I'm like, yeah, I was trying to be funny. It's a humor newsletter, but whatever. This time, I, I swear I got like dozens, maybe a hundred letters, and every single one of them was just ready to rip my head off. Like calling me a fake news journalist well, for some reason. <laughs> Um, and how dare you touch the Lord's anointed. I heard that and just freaking out on me. Um, and I was like, Hey, I wasn't even trying to criticize Trump. I was making fun of the way he talked and, you know, stuff like that. But even that apparently was out of bounds. And this is not with, I mean, Christianity today is more, I'd say center, uh, maybe even right. left for the evangelical right. world. Right. Um, but my goodness. And, and my handler there said, don't do that again. <laughs> Stop it. Don't have to tell it. me twice. So yeah, what the, the phenomenon he's talking about here is very real. Um, and of course, you know, when you get that kind of reaction, you've touched someone's idol, right? Uh, right. When you touch someone's idol, there's hell to pay. I don't Sky. think uh, Alasky's article is really saying anything we didn't already know. He's just confirming what we knew with some really great anecdotal evidence and some historical precedent. But the part that I still can't get my head around, and Drew, you're kind of touching on this. Let's take that conservative pro-Trump evangelical argument at face value. Let's say his morality is is irrelevant. Let's say he is a Cyrus who is pursuing policies that are beneficial to Christians, although that's, you know, you can argue the other way there. Let's just give him all of that. In the process, what Donald Trump has done and is continuing to do is undermine the very foundation of the Constitution and, and democracy in the United States. And if you believe that God has anointed him to save America and save Christianity in America, when the evidence is he's actually dismantling the foundations of America, and I would argue dismantling the foundations of the gospel for many Christians, it just doesn't hold up. It's not like Cyrus Cyrus let Israelites, let, the, let them leave Babylon to return to Judea to rebuild their cities, rebuild the temple, all that. It's not like Donald Trump is releasing Christians to go be Christian again. He's he's like the new king of Israel, and he's n- he doesn't have the values of a Christian or an American. He's not upholding the standards of the Constitution or democracy or the f- relinquishment of power after a lost election, all that. So the metaphor is is fundamentally flawed because he's not a foreign king releasing Christians to be Christian. He's a domestic king over America and over Christians who are who's fundamentally dismantling the very thing that he's been right. put in charge of. Right. That I've never been able to reconcile with this ridiculous Cyrus argument. And I I I would love to say, okay, let's move on from Trump. 
you know, his moment in the sun is gone, except it doesn't seem to be leaving. But even if he never returns to the White House or to the center of the public stage, he has has distorted and deformed the discourse so much. And there's so many people running for office trying to out Trump Trump. You know, the woman in Colorado with the bus that just says God, guns and babies on the side. God, guns and babies. That's what I'm about. You know, and the, well, the Marjorie two, Taylor, Gre- yeah, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, and the you know, and Lorraine Lauren Bobert over the weekend saying Jesus, if he'd had an AR-15, he wouldn't have been crucified. So if only Jesus had an AR-15, things would have turned out better for him. And saying it in a church, saying it in a church. So I, you know, the last thing he says where he says, "Will evangelicals who said character didn't count now also say craziness doesn't count. And the, the amount of crazy that's coming out of the people that are supposed to be on my team, the good guys, it's scary. The, the, what you're pointing at there, Phil, is there's, forget Donald Trump. There are two contributing factors that created Donald Trump that still exist. Number one, you have a right wing echo chamber, media echo chamber that is continually flooding the zone here with all of these conspiracy theories and nonsense. And I mean, even Fox News is refusing to cover the hearings, the January 6th hearings, because they don't want their people to possibly bump into facts. So as long as that echo chamber exists, you're going to keep feeding and shoveling people all this craziness. And then the second thing is you have a, a lot of Christian leaders and evangelical churches that are either contributing to that same mindset or they're remaining silent as we talked about earlier with the with the right. Tim Alberta story and as long as they're silent and as long as they're not combating these lies and and discernment and all the other things then you we're going to keep seeing this it's not going to go away so here's i don't know a- what the answer is there i i think the part of it is pastors and church leaders growing in their fear of god rather than the fear of the people in their church but the other side of it is this this echo chamber of right wing media and algorithms that keep people spinning in these nonsense conspiracy theories. And so whether you know, Trump stays or goes, these conditions are not going away soon. My the saddest thing of all this to me is the impact on the church, not the country. I can always flee back to Canada. OK, things go really south down here. But can you bring us with you? I don't well, think for the right you price, can. right? It's not going to be free. Okay. And the right, lu- the right, how big is your luggage? Yeah, right. Um, yeah. I, can Freedom you isn't free. <laughs> hey, Canada needs people. We'll take you. No, but for me, it's the, the impact. And there's a generational aspect to this. And I know you guys have seen this play out over and over again, but like where you got boomer parents and, and their, their, their children in their twenties, thirties are disaffected with the church falling away even from the faith. And when you talk to them, as I have talked to a lot of these folks, the thing that they cite over and over again is that sort of um, far right conservative political entanglement with Christian faith. They really don't like that. Okay. Uh, so even, even if it were a good thing, they, they just don't like it. And, and that's what really saddens me. And then when you talk to some of these older Christians and they want to go to war with these young people over political things. And I'm like, is that the hill yeah. you want to die on? Right. When these people are walking out of the church, they're, they're, um, they're uh, deconstructed off all the way right out of the faith. And right. um, that's, that's a bad hill to die on, man. And so that's, that's what makes me sad. I think, I think Russell Moore said it best, and this is a loose quote, but in, in the issue of why are so many young people walking away from the faith today, he said, it's not because they don't believe Christianity it's because they don't think we believe Christianity. The, the, their elders in the church, their parents, their parents' generation who have been caught up in all of this right-wing conservatism and especially the pro-Trump MAGA cult, as they see that, they recognize this is inconsistent with the teachings of Jesus. And so they walk away because they don't believe their own churches believe the gospel anymore. That's right. the real tragedy of all this. Right. Uh, Tim Alberta in the in a piece in the Atlantic says, having convinced so many evangelicals that the next election could trigger the nation's demise, Christian leaders effectively turned thousands of churches into unwitting cells in a loosely organized, hazily defined, existentially urgent movement, the types of places where paranoia and falsehoods flourish and people turn on one another. 
And that's what, you know, the second pastor, Brown, that's what he saw start to happen and why he felt like he couldn't just remain silent anymore. So he, start to see, he started to see falsehoods and paranoia popping up. You know, they're coming to get us and the, the government is out to stop, shut down Christianity and just absolute false statistics about whether it's the vaccines or whatever. Um, so he felt he couldn't stay silent anymore. So I guess what I'm wondering is, is it going to be harder and harder for pastors to stay out of it? Yeah, I think it goes back to Sky's point. At some point, you got to say something, right? Or else you are yeah. you're abdicating your responsibility as a spiritual leader, uh, especially when you see that kind of conspiratorial lunacy uh, popping up. Um, and, you know, I, I do want to, I, I want to try to be as charitable as possible to the Trumpy Christians. You know, and, and one thing Alaski mentioned is that, I, what's the word he used? Fear or panic or something? Um, desperation. Desperation. Yeah, that, that's a better word. Um, and I think a lot of people, in, in a way, as far as their diagnosis of what's happening is correct, in the sense that the West is secularizing, we have fewer Christians um, every year, um, and and in many ways, the broader culture no longer shares many of our beliefs and values. And so that can be disorienting when the ground is yeah. shifting under your feet, especially when you're an older Christian, right? And the response to that can be desperation. And then you start abandoning your your ethics, you become more utilitarian. It's a scorched earth policy when it comes to the other side, um, which is a mistake. So I think sometimes spiritual leaders have to go, hey, listen, I understand why you're uncomfortable, but here's the truth. Going forward, especially, you know, 10, 20 years out, Christians are going to have to learn how to live and minister in a culture from the margins in which they once held pride of place, in which we once occupied the center. That's an uncomfortable truth. Um, but being faithful in our time demands following Jesus rather than some strong man uh, that, that promises uh, that we'll have uh, the, the cultural uh, cachet or, or power that we used to have. Right, right. Okay, last bit of advice. We got crazy here. We're, we're, we're scared. We're desperate. We're worried. Um, Drew had a really good summation of just needing to not be afraid to find ourselves no longer centered in the culture, um, you know, to accept a life on the margins, which is, you know, kind of where the church started. And it's, it, it doesn't make it hard to follow Jesus just because you're not centered in your, in your culture. Sky, what's your last bit of advice? How do you wrap this all up? Uh, I don't know if I have any advice except um, I, I don't, I missed part of what Drew said because my signal dropped, but it was I think I disagree it was, it was with amazing. you. It was amazing. It was amazing. No, I think I disagree with you. Smoking hot. Oh, 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 oh we oh, disagree okay. with Drew with what you yeah, didn't I mean, hear him uh, say. I disagree okay, yeah. with I'm what I did I'm just going to assume I disagree with him because, <laughs> okay. you know, his mouth was moving. So clearly I disagreed with him. Um, <sighs> not entirely, but I think what, what your response assumes is that people who are truly committed to Jesus who were centered in the culture are now reacting to not being centered in the culture and they're reacting poorly. I wonder if part of what's going on here is more of an ap apocalyptic moment of in the true sense of the word an unveiling a revealing of the truth, which is maybe a bunch of people who we thought were committed to Jesus and the gospel were discovering never really were. And that their faith was far more in American cultural values and conservative values and all that was packaged together with some sense of Christianity. But now that those things are being uh, decoupled, they're definitely siding with the conservative political MAGA kind of stuff. And they're more than happy to jettison the Orthodox Christian teachings of Jesus that used to be bundled for them. So I'm concerned that the real explanation here is we're discovering a lot of people really never were committed to Jesus and the gospel. And so then therefore the advice I would give is find people in a community who are committed first and foremost to Jesus and the gospel. And you'll probably find people of diverse political interests, diverse prioritization of political issues and be in fellowship and community with them, learn from one another, be challenged by each other, but keep the gospel and Jesus first. Yeah. You're my rebuttal though. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We lost back. Sky. Um, he's back now. He said something brilliant that, that neither Drew nor I heard. So Drew is going to briefly rebut 
what he did not hear. Go, Drew. Your butt. I'm teasing because I actually agree. Uh, you know about what you said about this being uh, an apocalyptic moment in the Greek meaning, which is to reveal. Right. So a lot of people who had political idolatry in their heart uh, were revealed by this moment. At the same time, I do want to have sympathy for some of these folks because I know them and they tend yeah. to be older. They tend to be, and this is going to sound really condescending, uh, but not super sophisticated when it comes to understanding media. So they'll send me, you know, uh, stories from very non-reputable publications and take them as true. And so in some ways they've been, I feel like a victim of what you talked about earlier with the silo effect of our, the algorithms that reinforces our, our, our biases. Um, and they have, they have fallen into that without even really knowing what's happening sometimes because I know them and often like in their personal life, they, they love Jesus. They have high personal piety. Um, but in some ways they've been led astray or duped. Um, so I want to be compassionate, but yes, absolutely. This has been a very revealing moment and I am optimistic though. I feel like I may be going out on a limb here, but that Trump is losing a bit of his appeal with yeah. evangelicals. Yeah. Uh, I've known just anecdotally some people that are like, yeah, I'm not really on the Trump train anymore. And I think what did it for him was losing, right? As long as he was a winner, <laughs> they're going to stick with him. But he he did not okay. win, and he doesn't want to accept that. And I don't think okay, it will but, age but well. now there are these little Trumplets popping up here and there. Very true, very so, true. Yeah, and the church is often celebrating the Trumplets, and the Trumplets are putting together little church tours to travel around and brandish AR-15s from church platforms. There's some real, there's some nonsense going on guys, some real nonsense. And that's why we have a guest today to talk to you about stuff. And that's why we do this every week, because we're cutting through the nonsense. That sounds like like if we were, you know, Alex Jones, that would be our slogan. <laughs> I'm Alex Jones. I'm cutting through the nonsense. You got to say cutting through the crap because we started cutting with through, poop. And the cutting through the crap. Hey, sky's gone again. Okay. We don't need no sky. Thanks for listening, everybody. Hopefully next week we'll have more sky. And <laughs> talk to you later. Thanks, guys. Bye. This episode of The Holy Post is being brought to you by our friends at World Relief. Whether you've been a part of The Holy Post audience for a long time or just recently started listening, you know that we do not shy away from taking on really heavy topics. And there have been no shortage of those in recent weeks. After we tackle those tough issues, we often hear from you, our audience, about what you can do to help. You're concerned over what's going on in the world and the crises both here at home and around the globe. And one of the questions we get consistently is which organizations to partner with in these challenging times. I know that many of you are compelled by your love for Christ and the biblical call to justice, and you want to put an end to the cycles of suffering that millions around the world are experiencing. Things like violence, oppression, extreme poverty, and displacement. It's so hard to know where to begin and who to trust. That's why we're excited to tell you about The Path from our friends at World Relief. World Relief is the global organization that we and our churches trust to bring sustainable solutions to some of the world's toughest problems. And The Path is World Relief's community of bold, compassionate women and men of faith who are committed to fighting back against suffering and injustice and who are pursuing lasting change by giving monthly to World Relief. If you're looking for ways to put your faith into action, then I encourage you to join the path. And you do that through a monthly gift at worldrelief.org slash holy post. As a path maker, you'll be part of a like-minded global community that's committed to walking toward those who feel like the rest of the world is walking away from them. Whether it's the crisis in Ukraine, an earthquake in Haiti, or a refugee wave coming out of Afghanistan, you can trust that the PATH community is already there making a difference. And you can too, by joining the PATH today with your monthly gift at worldrelief.org slash holy post. The Holy Post is brought to you by our listeners who support us on Patreon. This episode is also sponsored by our friends at Faithful Counseling. 
This is Phil. My wife Lisa and I got married young and we were a little bit immature. One of our parents gave us as a wedding gift a year of counseling. At first I thought, wait, what are you saying about my mental health? But the ability to talk to a counselor as issues came up in our lives and in our relationship was a huge help. Faithful Counseling is a Christian counseling service with more than 3,000 licensed therapists across all 50 states with access by video or phone sessions or even chat and text. With expertise in depression, stress, anxiety, trauma, family conflicts, and more, you can ask for a new counselor at any time and financial aid is available for those who qualify. Best of all, Holy Post listeners get 10% off your first month from our sponsor, Faithful Counseling. So what do you got to lose? Give it a try. Go to faithfulcounseling.com slash holy post. Just fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and you'll get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's faithfulcounseling.com slash holy post. And now back to the show. The last few years have been stressful for everyone, but they've been particularly taxing for church leaders. New research is showing that a staggering number of pastors are ready to throw in the towel, and the reasons may not be what you think. The pastoral vocation has always been stressful and somewhat isolating, but the latest data uncovered by the Barna Group shows that political polarization is increasingly driving pastors out of the ministry. They find themselves in a no-win situation where if they talk about politics, they risk divisions in the church. But if they don't talk about politics, many of their people are being shaped and overrun by what they're hearing in the media, which is often very contrary to the gospel. My friend David Kinneman, the CEO of Barna Group, is back to talk about these statistics and other things that their research has uncovered in a reoccurring segment we call Barna Briefs. Since you like data, thought we would create a segment here to share with trends from everywhere. It's David Kinnaman and his Barna Briefs. One size fits all. Not available in California. Hey, David. Welcome back to the Holy Post. Hey, Sky. How's it going? Uh, Thanks for your time again and for the ongoing research you guys are doing over there. We've talked in the past about the numbers you uncovered during the pandemic about pastoral burnout and some of the kind of alarming rate at which pastors were considering leaving their ministries. Can you just remind us some of those numbers that stood out and and were kind of alarming? Yeah, I think um, it was one of the more, maybe not surprising, but certainly stark findings over the course of the pandemic is that uh, pastors were, were really struggling with their, with their ministry calling. So uh, in uh, January of 2021, a little less than a year into the pandemic, 29% of pastors said that they had given real and serious consideration to quitting full-time ministry. Um, usually there's a, you know, it's in the teens that that number would would, would sort of show up. You know, it's like we've, we track a little bit differently in other contexts, so it's a little hard having apples to apples, but that was certainly a very high number. <clears throat> and then by March of 2022, just a year later, um, and in, you know, sort of the pandemic was beginning to to recede. Of course, we're still dealing with 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 many of the long the long effects of that. But at March 2022, it was 42 percent. So more than two in five pastors said that they had given real and serious consideration to quitting. Which, which seems sort of, it seems sort of counter counterintuitive because you would think as the pandemic was lessening in severity as communities were opening up as churches were returning to in-person worship it would have bolstered the you know the excitement or motivation of pastors but it's the opposite do you have any sense of why well we did ask a question about what are some of the reasons why um, pastors are considering quitting and um, it, the top reason by far was the immense uh, stress of the job at 56 percent um, feeling lonely and isolated was at 43 percent. And then um, the current political divisions was 38%. And so um, just a real interesting, you know, those three things were easily the top three. The, the next the next three were, I'm unhappy with the effect this role has had on my family. I'm not optimistic about the future of my church. Uh, my vision for the church conflicts with the church's direction. So, <clears throat> you know, it feels like a lot of different things that are kind of, kind of shifting there for people. And, um, you know, the, this idea of, of feeling lonely and isolated, um, feeling like the stress of things was really, you know, getting to getting to these leaders, 
and then and then just this notion that they're you know that they're feeling the effects of the political climate so yeah. you know <clears throat> the the ongoing even though some of the acute nature of the lockdown and other parts of the pandemic had had been shifting at that time um, you know, you just realize that these leaders have been have been leading through a lot of a lot of change. This is anecdotal. It's not coming from your numbers, but there have been a, a, quite a few reports that have come out. Most recently, I think Willow Creek issued a statement that since reopening after the pandemic, attendance and numbers are way down from what they were. So I wonder if a factor in this is that during the pandemic, pastors were obviously under an enormous amount of stress. Their normal way of operating was completely uh in chaos, but there was this expectation, oh, when things, when we're past this, things will go back to normal. But for a lot of places, it hasn't. Numbers are way down, which means stress is going to be way up for a lot of these pastors. Is that part of this? I think it's a huge part of it. Um, we, we see in our research, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but you know, a large, a large number of churches have lost have lost attenders uh, over the course of the pandemic. Others have have grown. Some have have stayed the same. But but more more often than not, uh, churches have <clears throat> you know lost attenders. Um, the good news, um, the silver lining, is that there hasn't been as as commensurate a decline of giving. So more churches have stayed financially stable, which seems to indicate that the people that were the most committed to attending ha- are also the the, the most you know, kind of, um, engaged, engaged in giving, they're the more, sure, you know, sure. kind of whole heart, whole, let's just say wholehearted disciples. It's not to say that those who have not are, you know, are, are you know, sort of, um, you know, the, the, the chaff, but there's been this, this sense, I think that leaders are sort of seeing this winnowing out and, and, you know, the people that you thought were your best friends, they're just not that into you. Um, and um, so I know a lot of leaders have really taken it to heart when they see, you know, that people just disappeared, you know, and there's almost right. like they have a whole a whole new church. That's even a more significant, you know, reality is that more more leaders say, I just have a completely new church. Whether we're grown, whether we're the same, whether we're whether we've declined significantly, it's just it's not the same. So just under the the number of the top reason given was immense stress of the job, and you've alluded to some of the factors that have contributed to that recently. The, the next highest one was, I feel lonely and isolated. Now, that's not unique to pastors. There's been a lot of data that shows people increasingly throughout our society are feeling lonely and isolated, which leads to all kinds of mental health challenges and, and other um, bad presenting symptoms. And it was probably accelerated by the pandemic where we were more isolated and lonely, sometimes by necessity. Um, but what is it about the pastoral vo- vocation the ministry calling that lends itself to even a, a greater isolation and loneliness. Well, I think certainly during the pandemic, it was partly the, um, the fact that, you know, I mean, we all felt more lonely and isolated, particularly those of us that might've had an, an extroversion streak or who got our, our, you know, kind of uh, sense of identity from, from being with or leading others. Um and so I think I think that's a big part of it is is you know pastors have sort of self selected into ministry because they're some kind of people person um, they either like being with people or they like leading or communicating to people and so I think there's a real sense when you can't see the whites of people's eyes in person it can really lead to that sense of isolation and I think all the tools that leaders have. Um, and again, one of the one of the truths about pastoral ministry today is that it's not really pastors; it's really a group of communicators um, by self by self defined defined gifting and, and passion. So, seven out of ten pastors say, you know, their their top gift, their top passion point is communicating. And um, you know, I think I think people feel lonely and isolated because they just haven't had the kind of you know kind of audiences that they would have ordinarily had. Um, and again, I think there's, there's, um, you know, if there's, there's many things we might wave a wand at and ask the church to, to become a better version of itself. One of them is to express these different parts of, of, you know, sort of godly leadership. Ephesians four has one in apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, te- teachers, and how do we, you know, look at a, a more f- fully formed, fully embodied, you know, not, not just the communicators, absolutely a place for communicators, but what are the other roles uh, that need to be alongside congregational leadership, whether that's you know paid or lay or or you know bivocational, and um, and so I think being lonely and isolated for a group of people that are you know used to having a live audience, um, you know if you're a performer, 
if you're a singer, if you're a stand-up comedian, um, you know, if you're, um, uh, you know, if the people who are road warriors, obviously a lot of, a lot of us who spend a lot of time on the road, we're happy to get some time off, but then all of a sudden the itch starts to, you know, grow to get back out on, on the road. And so I think pastors are feeling lonely and isolated for that reason. Um, other research we've shown, we've seen shows that, you know, pastors aren't particularly, not, not all pastors, but many pastors are not particularly good at having sort of mutually accountable friendships right. that aren't about, you know, people in their church or people that kind of are, you know, high dollar donors or kind of the movers and shakers. And so I think that'd be another thing that we all could look at, but certainly if you're in pastoral ministry, you know, what kind of friendships are we keeping that just, that aren't, that aren't, they're not laughing at your jokes because you're the senior pastor. They're laughing at the jokes because they actually really care for you and, and, you know, believe in you and, and enjoy your company. Let's move on to this third category that they identified for reasons pastors wanting to quit. And that is the political divisions, the current political divisions. A lot of pastors find themselves in an absolutely no win situation today, because if you remain silent about the political dynamics that are happening in the country, you get blasted from people on all sides because you're not speaking up. If you do speak up, you run the risk of, well, two risks. One, alienating people who may disagree with the way you are speaking up or the the position you're advocating. Or two, uh, you run the risk of having politics eclipse the gospel and mm. eclipse the situation. So, I mean, I've painted this impossible situation, but I feel like uh, pastors are are stuck now where they, there's no win. There's no winning. You have to pick silence or speaking and you're going to get blasted no matter which one you pick. What wisdom do you have based on your data or your interactions with pastors about how to think about that, how to not think about it, what steps to take, which ones to definitely avoid? And we actually saw exactly what you are alluding to um, in a study call. We, we call it faith leadership in a, in a divided culture and pastors felt at times pressure to speak out um, and then at times pressure uh, and and sort of judgment for speaking out. Like you can't, right. you, it, is, it is literally a no in a catch 22. Um, so I think um, the, the heart of the matter is a, a, what I believe is a discipleship problem. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, we, we, um, we have a lot of great people that are attenders. We have people that understand parts of the Christian story uh, but we really haven't, we're not by and large a disciple making church across North America. And so, you know, my, my, um, my response is let's look at these next 10 years as an opportunity to disciple the political, you know, the, the sort of a political theology. And, uh, I'm actually, I'm, I'm okay with churches, you know, sort of talking about politics. They should talk about politics. They should, they should bring, um, you know the king, the kingdom of of heaven into our you know sort of thinking about what does it mean to you know run government and to you know be a, an active member of our of our communities and our society. Um, and so on that basis, I, I, I actually think we need we need more um, you know m more tools for this. And, and this goes to so if discipleship is the problem, what are the what are the real solutions? To do that, and one of the things that is, is really seems pretty clear to me after a lot of years of studying this is that one of the reasons we struggle is that the the the, the rhetorical tool of a sermon, uh, the homiletic, is is powerful. It's never been more important, but it's never been less sufficient to bring about the kind of discipleship in its full form. And and it's like you know we're being discipled by screens, which is not a homiletic. Those that's a different rhetorical s set of tools that we're all subjected to in, in the, the realm of digital media and content and streamed programs, et cetera. And so I actually think there's some, you know, real, real, like we need a pedagogical renewal. We need, we need new forms of Christian learning. We need, we need an imagination to say, you know, here's the podcasts you should listen to. Here's the, the courses you might take. Um, we actually need people to come like, this is, this is sort of that we need better small group curriculum. We need, we need, you know, sort of videos that can be piped into our, our, our communities. Uh, we need better youth, youth and young adult materials, uh, because we do need, you know, like a, a theology of, of how it is that we engage in politics. And, you know, I think the Christian tradition absolutely has all of that, whether you're looking at, you know, so, so something from Leslie Newbegin or Francis Schaefer or, you know, Chuck, Chuck Colson, or, I mean, wh whoever are, are, uh, you know, Walter Brueggemann, um, 
uh, and, and those just happen to be men. So I'm sure there are others that, that aren't coming to mind right this minute uh, who are people of color and who are women. Uh, but like, how do we actually embody this um, uh, p- political life in, in, in Christ? And I think for many of us, it's like even the even I actually think some sometimes the the things that you know are, are let's say our angriest birds in our c- congregation they're they're actually like raising really important points. I mean, there's some real outliers, but the reasons why people get up in arms about gun control or the reason people get up in arms about you know a, a vaccines and mandates um, in terms of like what are the implications of totalitarianism, soft totalitarianism in our in our society, and when does the government get to choose for people and you know, like these are all actually really healthy parts of of a vibrant society that that actually cares about its destiny. But the problem is that we just were using, you know, like popsicle sticks to try to build the empire state building. Um, it's just like we we actually need much more sturdy ways of thinking about life in Christ in this modern age, in this late modern age. And so I think I think if we could have a reformation of the way we way we think about it um the way we think about life in this in this context um it, it could be great by the way this is it seems like there's there's something really powerful in that uh i don't know if you've heard but christian education and seminaries are having a harder time than ever not everyone but many of them are uh the, the business model is really yeah. is really uh is on uh on thin ice and so you've got some of the greatest thinkers and educators and and you know communicators who aren't just about homiletics. They're you know they're they're very structured in their you know in their how they would build a curriculum. And now we have a church that is in desperate need of that kind of you know training and thinking and integrate integration. And um, I'm just you know always thinking like, gosh, there's got to be a better way than just asking someone to plunk down you know a chunk of money to be educated and get a degree completion program. And, you know, the, the, these, these church communities that are sort of like, you know, tr- trying to strain together political uh, theology, political engagement with, you know, sound bites and, you know, right. the, the, the sort of s- s- sermons um, and sermons are great. They're just not, they're not the only way we learn. And so um, anyway, that to me feels like we have a discipleship problem. Could we could we have a reformation of Christian education? Not not just in the like, here's another book, here's another book, here's another lecture, but certainly not excluding those things. And because because then we start to understand like, what was the history of you know the Second Amendment? What's the history of the way Christians throughout history have have you know engaged in their political environments? How how do, what are the different options that we have? Um, and how do we then you know use this um, this more sturdy gospel uh, in all of life, and that to me feels like such an exciting uh, set of opportunities for uh, for the future church. Yeah, that's a very optimistic and hopeful <laughs> point of view. But I I think you're absolutely right. I mean, there it isn't just that pastors aren't talking about these issues or they're not used to talking about it. It's that we have we have inherited a structure of ministry, a very sermon centric structure of ministry that, <laughs> as good and necessary as it may be, is not sufficient in meeting the discipleship challenge of this moment. Well, analogy that I've thought about is it feels a little bit like when I was in seminary and a lot of the ministry years that I had and people I know in ministry, like we've been trained to be like family physicians that relatively healthy people come in and see us once or twice a year. They get their shots, they get a checkup, you know, occasionally they come in because they have a fever, you know, chronic pain somewhere, whatever, and we deal with it. And that's kind of how we've been used to ministering to people. They're doing relatively well and they come in once a week and we, you know, give them a checkup. We boost them a little bit with, with some scripture and theology and on their way. And that was sufficient for a season, but now we're like in a war zone and people are being brought in with severe trauma and, and we're still trying to operate like we're a pediatric ward that's dealing, doing, doing school physicals. Like, no, we, it, this is, we need an ER, we need a mash unit. We need people who right. are trained in dealing with, you know, severe trauma. And a lot of people in ministry are going, ah, I know I wasn't equipped to do this. I don't know how to talk about the second amendment when there's another mass shooting. I don't know how to deal with, you know, the role of government in a pandemic. And, you know, I, they just don't feel equipped. And your point is we have people who are equipped. We have brilliant theologians and thinkers and 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 people in seminaries but there's this disconnect between that resource the church has and 
boots on the ground, mobilizing it, making it happen in our churches, partly because our structures just aren't congruent with that kind of learning. Um, so I'm hopeful yeah, that, that exactly, that's exactly, uh, that's exactly the point. I think, I think you've said it, uh, you summarized my point, my point very well. And I'm convinced that out of great crises and, 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 and the tragedy of the last few years, um, you know, c- come new, new ideas. I just, I just right. hope that in some ways I just hope the pain has gone deep enough. Um, not that I'm, you know, not that I'm like a fan of pain who could be, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, I think we're going to have some interesting and probably tumultuous economic things ahead. And, and that might right. actually be the one thing that gets Amer- America's attention, Americans attention in ways that even a pandemic and social unrest and political division and, and, you know, wars around the world might not is that, you know, God might have to humble us even further in terms of our, our reliance on our, on our, you know, f- financial stability. Um, again, I just, I think there's some things that are happening and, and, you know, again, God who's so- sovereign overall, um, I think uh, still has many, many lessons for us as, as, as uh, people of, of Jesus in, in this time. And um, I'm just hopeful that there will be these new, new ways of thinking and understanding the, the, the problems, like the discipleship yeah. problem is now as clear as it's ever been. And so we, we need to commit ourselves to, you know, new, new, new ways of thinking about, you know, how to build a, a, a resilient church. Right. Um, it, but that assumes and I know Barna's at the front of this is, is properly diagnosing the problem, right? You've, I think, properly diagnosed it as this is a discipleship issue, which requires a discipleship solution. Unfortunately, in some segments of the church, they're, they're primarily identifying it as a church attendance problem. Mm-hmm. And we just need to get more butts and seats and, and money and plates and people engaged in programs, which leads to a completely different set of solutions. All right, before we wrap up, uh, last question. And... This is going to sound bad. I'm just going to warn you right now. Um, <laughs> in, wait. In, in March of this year, you guys uncovered that 42% of pastors are considering quitting. Now, I think most of us, when we encounter that number and we see that stat, we automatically assume this is a terrible thing. Like the red sirens, lights are going, like this is warning, warning, this is bad news. 42% of pastors may quit. Is there any interpretation of this in which it may not be bad news? Yeah, no, I think there's a a, a lot of um, good news buried in that data. Um, I mean, first, let's say that um, anybody who's going through kind of a, a crisis of calling and vocation, it's probably a better thing than just sitting there and saying, hey, nope, nope, not, nothing to see here. Everything's fine. Mm-hmm. So to the extent that soul searching, I think, leads us to to a better place, even if sometimes it takes us on a circuitous path, that's a good thing. Um, and there are many, many pastors, we've been writing about this for more than, a, a, well, five years now. There are many pastors who um, the whole industry of pastoring has aged. And so um, the average age of pastors uh, is in the mid 50s, whereas, you know, 25 years ago, they were in, the, in their mid 40s. So it's like the whole industry has aged. Now, one of the bad sets of, of data, if you if you peel back, what we were learning is that it's younger pastors who are even more likely to say they want to quit, and women who are leading are more likely to quit, want to quit than men. And so, um, and I'm not to say, hey, if you're an older pastor, it's time for you to, to 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 hang them up. It's just that I do think this has been a great winnowing process, and and to that extent, I think you know God is is sort of pulling back. Um, you know, pulling back scales, he's pulling back, um, you know, the things that sort of kept us in and the illusions of ministry that maybe, maybe propelled us. Um, I just wouldn't want, I wouldn't want anyone who, who is sort of meant to stay to leave. And I wouldn't want anyone who's meant to leave to sort of like rationalize, you know, the pension or <laughs> the, the reasons why they, yeah. they, you know, they think they still, they still should stick around. And, and I am hearing more and more stories of, of younger leaders who are, um, you know, and by, by younger, I mean like in their thirties, early forties are not all that young. And they're, they're feeling as though, you know, the, the boomer leaders are just, they're just, they're not, they're not ready to go. And, mm-hmm. you know, again, God can speak into each heart, but, but I am hearing more and more. It's sort of reminiscent of like 10, 15 years ago when we started talking um, here at Barn about 
you know, 20 something is struggling to find their place in Christian churches and the dropout problem. Again, it's not even really a chronological thing, like how old are you? And you should, you should, you know, you should quit. Yeah. It's more like, are you really called to this? And then in what ways, even if you're called to this, how can you embrace this new moment where you being in the seat doesn't mean you're taking up oxygen from other leaders in your, in your church. Um, and for those listeners who, you know, aren't in professional ministry, you know, what does all this tell us about, you know, encouraging the leaders around us by by reminding them how, how important they have been in your life during the pandemic and maybe in years past um, how can you show up as a friend to spiritual leaders and pastors because you know they've been a kind of frontline worker um, through this this pandemic um, what does it mean for all of us to embrace the kind of idea of, of pastoring leading people into the presence of, of, of Jesus and work in spirit and in truth? Um, you know, I think the role of pastoring is much broader than just the people who get a paycheck from a local church. So totally. how, can we all, how can we all step up and serve as the kind of Levitical, you know, kind of uh, people who say, no, we actually believe believe in the presence and power of a creator of the universe who, you know, who actually, uh, you know, as a neighbor, as a coworker, as a soccer mom as a whatever like like pastoring is a high and sacred calling and i think god's bringing a new a new vision an expanded vision of what it means to be the priest of all believers my guess is uh, i know there's quite a few pastors who listen to the holy post and are listening to this right now and they are probably disproportionately represented in that 42 percent who are struggling because they listen to the holy post i can assume a couple things about the way they think um but if you're in that group that 42% who are thinking about quitting, you kind of have th three general options, right? One is to hang up your spurs and quit and, and do something else. Option number two is to just persevere, push through it, hang on. Maybe you're just wanting to retire. You're close to that pension, whatever it might be, which isn't a great option, but that's an option. And then the third one, and this is one I, I, I think would be the most encouraging is you, you, want to find a different way of doing this, a different way of ministering, of being a pastor that is sustainable, is, brings flourishing to you, your family, and certainly the people you are called to lead. And and that's what Barna is really trying to help lead the way on. And you guys have this new thing coming in the fall. It's a six-month cohort called The Resilient Pastor, which Glenn Packham has been on the show. He wrote the book, The Resilient Pastor, based on a lot of Barna data. Can you share just briefly a little bit about what that cohort is going to do and how people can be a part of it? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, we started feeling a burden for pastors. I mean, almost uh, at, the, at, the, at the founding of our company in many ways, but also over the course of the pandemic, uh, you know, Carrie Newhoff and I started the, the Church Pulse Weekly podcast out of a desire to serve leaders, um, you know, who are going to be, you know, um, it, even more than we imagined, uh, knocked off their, their, their axles. Um, <clears throat> and so all along we felt this burden. Then as we began to see the data about, you know, the, the crisis of calling, which again, as we've said, is both, both really, um, a crisis and also a great opportunity. And uh, so we've we've developed this thing called um, the Resilient Pastor Cohort. As you mentioned, Glenn Packiam wrote a book. We started initiate we initiated that book project well before the pandemic, but it came out um, in um, the beginning part of 2022 called the Resilient Pastor. And um, and so we're so pleased with you know being able to partner with with uh, such a, a great and humble and wise um, you know author and leader in, in Glenn. And then this this cohort is designed to bring you face to face with uh several dozen other leaders and then with some really incredible um sort of mentors who will help guide you through you know what it means to be resilient and so um it's a, a cohort model so you know i talked a little earlier about like new forms of learning um for the church and i think you know it's not just like a conference where you attend it's not just a free webinar because it's going to you know it's going to both cost you something um, you know, and most importantly, your time and your commitment. But I think it's going to be a, a journey that, you know, what, that leaders will look back and say, this was a really transformative experience. You know, if you're, if you're one of the leaders who's thinking like, do I want to stay in this? How do I stay in this? As, as you said, Sky, like what's a better way to do this? Um, the co this resilient pastor cohort is exactly the place to try to, 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 to learn and discern that together uh, with others. So we'd love to have you join us.
Yeah, and if people want to learn more about it, you can go to barna.com slash cohort. And you guys have been kind enough to offer a discount code to Holy Post listeners. If you're a pastor or you want your pastor to be involved in this, you can pass it along. When you go to barna.com slash cohort, you can put in the code Holy Post 15. I think it may have to be all caps, but it's Holy Post, no spaces, and the number 15 for a 15% off discount on the Resilient Pastor Cohort. David, thank you so much for your insights again, your your research, and for offering these resources that hopefully will bring the church into a better future. Appreciate it. Absolutely, Sky. Thanks so much for having me. Always a pleasure to to chat with you and to imagine a imagine a better, healthier pastor and a, a better and healthier church. Well, we'll do it again soon. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more. Thank you.